sucks if you're like, yes, last year was absolutely insane. Um, so today I really just want to talk to you guys about back to school tips because we are coming from a very rough year. We're starting a whole new school year. Um, so I wanted to go over really three huge tips to kind of transition us into this next school year. And then um, I'll have a few pointers to give you guys. And then I will allow you guys to ask some questions. So please utilize the chat box. And if you're watching the replay, definitely ask any questions down below in the comments and I will get back to you. Like I stated earlier, I'm trying to do this every you know, two weeks so that you guys have the opportunity to come on live and answer any questions that you guys have. All right, so the first back to school tip that I have is to build a classroom community during the first 14 days of school. So that's the first two weeks of school. After the first two weeks of school, it is very, very difficult to establish rules, routines, build that trust um, within your children. It's almost impossible to do it. Um, later on in the school year, but it is, you know, it can be done, but it's easier to start off firm and then kind of loosen up than it is to start off loose and then tighten up later. So that is definitely um, one of my big tips. And also use the first two weeks of school to build the relationships between kids and between yourself and students, because building a classroom community is all about building trust. And this is your time to build trust. This is literally your time to get them to trust you, for you to start trusting them, to build up that relationship. This is also a great time to do icebreakers. Icebreakers, um, like back to school icebreakers, is simply allow you to get to know your students. And the first two weeks is all about getting to know them. Yes, we want to assess them. Yes, we want to see what they know. We want to see what the learning loss was. How far behind are they after the pandemic? I get it. You want to learn all these things about your kids. But trust me when I say it is harder to build the relationship later on in the school year than it is at the first two weeks of school. So spend the first two weeks getting to know them. I promise it will come. You will assess them. Okay? Okay, you're gonna you're gonna learn what they learn. You're gonna learn what they don't know. You're gonna do all of that. But spend the first two weeks just getting to know them and building trust and relationships between everybody in the classroom. Um, really cool things you can do with building a classroom community. I've seen different classrooms come up with a classroom song. I've seen people do like a handshake or a gesture as kids come in. I've seen, what else have I seen? Um, I've seen the other one, I used to do this. Um, when people come in the classroom, all the kids state something. I know for me, when my classroom um, was in the theme of an iPhone, like my door was an iPhone. My uh, display wall was Facebook. I had a Twitter wall. Twitter was a ticket out the door. Like they would put their sticky notes, like leave a tweet <laughs> as they left the door. Like, so I had a whole app theme room. And um, with that, anytime people came in, they would say, hi, Siri, welcome. And then when that person leave, left the room, they would say, there's an app for that. Um, they would say, learning, there's an app for that. So just little cute things like that really build that classroom community. So think of ways that you can build that classroom community as you guys, as you guys, as you transition into school. Um, the next thing you can do is establish routines within the first 14 days of school. So not only are the first 14 days of school important for building that classroom community, it is equally as important as building routines, okay? Um, when it comes to routines, most people just go to rules. Like, okay, I need all the rules. What do I want kids not to do? Um, but when I say rules, I'm 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 suggesting you only come up with three to five rules. Always make your rules positive. So instead of saying no running, you'll put you'll put walk. Okay, sit down. You don't have to put um, no hitting, no jumping, no scratching. You can just put keep your hands to yourself. Bam! That just wrapped out so many negative things into a positive way. Um, so really every classroom only needs three to five rules um, and it's all about routine. So think think less about rules, more about routines. 
then don't forget to ask any questions you have in the chat box. Um, for me, it's right here. I don't know where it is on y'all's end, but definitely ask any questions in the chat box. So three to five rules that are all stated in a positive um, verbiage and um, all about routines. And because you guys, I was just watching the news. So this new strand is very crazy. So what I suggest is that you prepare for both. Okay. So do, use the first two weeks of school to prepare for both face-to-face -face and online instruction. So Go over all your routines for both scenarios. If kids have all your face-to-face -face routines and all your virtual routines, then they'll be set up for success no matter what the future holds. We don't know what's going on from one day to another day, and I think this last year has taught us that. Um, so prepare your kids for both. What does that look like? That looks like you taking the time right now after you watch this live Sitting back, um, I actually did a video on online strategies and coming up, I have um, different things you can do to really go over and build up that classroom. So think about all the routines that you want your kids to do and go ahead and think about it for both scenarios, online and in person, and then use the first two weeks of school to really roll that out. So if you're starting off the school year face-to-face, -face, roll out all your face-to-face -face instructions that first week. Do not overwhelm the kids with the what ifs. And then the second week, you can roll out the um, virtual, uh, virtual routines. If the opposite, if you're starting off virtually, then I personally would suggest you only do the virtual ones and then save your face-to-face -face routines that you wanna go over for when you start transitioning face to face. Let's say you transition face to face first week of September. I wouldn't start going over that stuff till like the last week of August. All right, so y'all think about you want a routine for lining up. How do you want the kids to line up? You need a routine for walking in the hallway. You need a routine for getting materials, especially do, um, if you're wanting all the kids to have their own individual. Um, if you want all the kids to have their own individual materials, think, how do you want that routine? Logging on the internet and com com uh, communicating with you. How do you want them to actually communicate with you? I know last week we went over online strategies. And one thing that I mentioned was having a resource home um, and how do you want them to ask questions? And then the next tip, and then I'll jump to your question, um, show empathy. Okay, so a lot of these kids, have been scared. They don't know what's going on. Their homes are unstable right now. They've had an entire year of worry and stress. Some of your kids may have been completely virtual all last year, meaning they did not get a lot of chances to socialize with other kids. So you're going to have some kids that want to come to school and they're like, ah, la, 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 and that's all they want to do is talk because they haven't been able to do that. You're going to have other kids that it's foreign to them to play and communicate. Um, I know with my daughter, she just had a play date recently with a child who hasn't been to school in a whole year. And my daughter was in daycare. And so Kendall's used to, you know, communicating and playing, but the other child would just sat there. Like she didn't remember what to do. Like, how do you interact with other kids? So you'll have to teach kids literally have to social how to socialize again. You'll teach them literally how to interact, how to share, how to do all of that stuff. They're not used to doing that. Um, and then keep in mind, I say show empathy with them. Some kids may have experienced death over this last year. And if you teach, you know, kindergarten or first grade, like that's for them, a six, five, six, seven year old, that is detrimental. So just Think about where they have gone. They have gone this last school year. Um, we have one question in the chat box. How would I teach growth mindset? Oh, that's a good question, especially going into this next school year. So definitely start off your first two weeks as you're building those relationships with your students as you are getting to know them. Also get to know where it is that they want to go. Um, some of these kids like you know, we don't know what they've experienced this last year. Um, and they've had their parents try to teach them as much as they possibly can. So when it comes to growth mindset, a lot of that is kind of relying 
final two things, confidence and goals. Okay, you want to build confidence with kids and also have them establish goals. So that first week of school, the first thing you could do is establish a goal. You might not be able to build their entire confidence. You can do things to kind of start that, especially when it comes to socializing, but definitely have the kids establish goals. And you can actually have them create short-term and long-term goals. I know I did kind of a game um, in my icebreaker video, and I can um, link that after after this. Um, but one of the games, what do you expect to learn this school year? Okay, if kids have kids think what what do they actually want to learn or what do they actually want to do this school year? And then um, see what are the kind of the similarities. If you have a, you know, a data wall, you could easily, easily take some sticky notes, have kids like draw, draw on the sticky note if they're little, or you can write down each one of their goals and put it on a growth, like a growth um growth wall, because you don't have any data at the beginning of the year, but you can at least start off the year with their goals in mind. And then to build that confidence that they need, um, you really comes down when it comes to relationships. Like the more that you spend time getting to know them, the more you spend time allowing them to socialize, get to know each other, they'll start to get confidence. Um, and a lot of their confidence will come once they see that they're closer to whatever goal it is that they want to do. So if they stated they wanted to read, Keep that in mind. So if little, you know, Tommy said he wanted to read, then as little Tommy starts making benchmarks or milestones towards that goal, start praising him. Um, another cute thing you can have is like a goal, a marble, like a goal jar, and you can just get some marbles. And each time, each time any child gets closer to their goal, you guys put a classroom marble in, you know, in the jar. One that definitely helps community build up your classroom community, but two, it helps with the growth mindset and it will build that confidence. Um, good, the growth wall suggestion, yay. That was actually a very good question, especially because we are dealing with kids who may not have the most confidence, especially after this pandemic, because They've probably have been told what they don't know this whole last year versus being told the things that they do know. Um, and I also um, want you guys to think, what do you need? So think about what is it that you need as um, an educator? Your needs matter also. Your needs matter also. I think if anything, teaching after a pandemic that we've learned is that we have to put ourselves first in some capacity. So where do you fit? Where do your needs fit? Um, if anything, you have a work-life balance. So what is a one day of the week that you're going to leave work early or at one time, you know, at contract hours? What is the one day that you're going to stay late and work on your kids' needs? You know, um, so just kind of go into the school year with that in mind, like, what are my needs? What are my kids' needs? And how can I balance my time to fit both needs? Um, because those both matter. I do have um, some icebreaker games talking about, you know, first first week of school, first two weeks of school that can help you guys build that classroom community. I have that link down below. And if you want to get one of those games for free, <laughs> I also have a survey in the description as well. It'll only take you about 10 minutes, but it'll help me out tremendously. Um, and I will email you one of the free games from the ice, the back to school icebreaker. So you are able to get a back to school game for free in exchange of 10 minutes of your time completing that survey. So that link is in the description as well. Um, does anybody have any other questions? I do want to add, start asking some, I want to ask some questions. So my first question is, what are you most worried about or concerned about when it comes to teaching this school year, especially during the transition? Like I literally just finished watching the news and they were talking about all the surrounding counties and which counties are going back face to face. Now some counties are changing virtually. Um, so it had me thinking about you guys and what your needs are. Like, do you need more online suggestions, face to face? It looks like everybody's kind of doing both. I know 
recently I posted just asking what what did what do you prefer? Do you prefer face-to-face? -face? Do you prefer virtual? Because they do both have completely different needs um, and different demands from you. So when you think about that in totality, it can get very overwhelming and frustrating, especially if you are trying to literally cater to 25 kids and all of their needs, then you want to have kind of like a clear focus. Um, but unfortunately, like I stated earlier, that's impossible to know every day what tomorrow is going to hold. So think about what are your needs and what are your kids' needs and how to meet that in the middle through that classroom community. That's why it's so important to build a classroom community the first two weeks so that you have the opportunity to adjust to no matter what is coming. I can see that face-to-face um, -face for younger children. When I did the poll, it seemed like anybody that did things outside the classroom, like Esau or, um, or, or, or younger kids, like kindergarten and first grade, said that they preferred face-to-face. -face. But other teachers like that either did older kids or um, advanced kids all preferred online. So and I especially think when you're dealing with younger children, a lot of them don't know how to work a computer. So a lot of their um, developmental skills as far as like typing, um, working the mouse, like those type of things aren't quite developed yet. So it'll take a while for you to get in the groove. You can't really say drop something in the chat box because it may take 20 minutes for that child to sit and type in the chat box. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so what about the classroom setup are you most worried about? We have we have a comment in the chat box that said, I'm worried about the classroom setup. Um you loved virtual teaching, but it was not conducive for kindergarten. So when it comes to the classroom setup, what are you most worried about? Is it how to space out kids or is it just a classroom layout? Because um, last year, you didn't really have to do a classroom layout because you're virtual. So um, what was it that you're, that you're most concerned about? I think the, the most important part is coming up with routines that are conducive for teaching out of a pandemic. So both, okay. So let me kind of address both. So a lot of the best practices are the same, but you almost have to tweak them. So overall common core expects you to get kids to socialize. Well, that alone requires kids to talk and be close to each other at some capacity, right? Um, one thing that I realized, and even being in a few of the classrooms this summer, is a lot of, seems like a lot of schools don't have the space to actually social distance. So that part kind of becomes impossible to do um, in certain settings, depending on how many kids you have in a space. So now it's time to actually really be creative. What is the best way? We do want to have allow kids to have some sort of social social um, setting, whether it be completely groups or just partners. So the first suggestion is, okay, try to set up in partners first before groups. Is it impossible? Yes, impossible. <laughs> it's impossible for adults to all gather in a room and still social distance. I mean, so some things um, are uncontrollable. Some things are virtual, like virtually impossible possible we just can't do but let's focus on what we can do you could have different pods or different you know groups of kids I think one thing when you think about centers so typically centers is the most interactive time within a classroom right um so you have to think about okay how do I want my kids to rotate do I even want them to get up would it be easier to have one person gather the materials each time I ring the bell? So that is one suggestion. Instead of having all the kids get up and move around and having all these kids go around, you can simply have materials that each child just has either already at their desk and maybe the task then changes. Yes, centers. Um, still, because because in order to really close the gap from, I mean, we already had a learning gap. I don't know if you guys know, but 
before the pandemic, six out of every 10 kids entered kindergarten not on level. That's 60% of kids claim into kindergarten in the United States not ready. That is, and there are 4 million kids that start kindergarten every year. And I say kindergarten because that's technically like the first grade level of elementary school. So that's 2 million, over 2 million kids entering kindergarten pre-pandemic, right? This is before COVID. They're coming into kindergarten behind, right? So now you have this last year where kids, the learning gap widened even more. And so now, the according to the, um, the United States Department of Education, they're stating that they're expecting kids to never get the skills, and they're just expecting kids to never regain the skills. So when you think about that, okay, so that means the kids that were in kindergarten, kids that were in first grade last year, those kids that would have spent last year getting the reading skills, writing skills, math skills, all the main skills that you need to function in life, they didn't get that. Hey, <laughs> um, they didn't get that. So now the gap's even wider. And there are certain things like we stated that you just can't control. So you can't control the time you have in the classroom. You can't control um, the environment. You can't even control the pandemic, right? So you can't control any of that. So what you can control is, is the small amount of time you have with the kids um, and the actual classroom environment and what you do with it. Well, you can't control the environment. You can control what you do with the environment. So when, when I say that, I said all that to say, going back to how you can actually do centers, um, centers is your only time to actually catch those kids up. It's your only time to do a small group. It's your only time to do one-on-one -on -one instruction. It's your only time to kind of cater to kids' needs. So centers have to be done. They have to. If you not, if you end up not doing centers and you decide to do whole group all day long, then you'll never have the time to catch kids up. And with that, that means they're going to completely stay behind. We just went over the stats and they will forever be behind. And then if you have, if you're teaching younger kids, that means that they just missed out on reading for the rest of their life. Like I struggled reading. I struggled with reading when I was in kindergarten and first grade and I struggled my entire life until I was an adult. It, it took me to become a teacher to go back and relearn phonics. And that is how I really learned how to read. i um, not saying I didn't know how to read growing up, but I was taught off memor memorizing. So I was literally the guinea pig. I was the first class or, that was introduced to sight words. So I was um, memorizing things. So yeah, there's positives and negatives. I can memorize something at the drop of a dime, but I could not phonetically sound out a word to save my life, my entire life, until I was an adult. So that means that those kids that were learning, supposed to learn phonics last year, they didn't get that skill, and now they're coming into school. So you're not going to be able to really cater to those type of needs in whole group. You have to do centers to read. Yeah, so let's let, let's think about that. So how could we do centers? Um, I actually have a few videos coming out next week, you guys. I'm going back to two videos a week. So I have a center. I have um, two videos coming up of centers, do they matter, and how to actually set up centers. So that video is next Thursday. So make sure you watch that. Um, so different things that you can do with centers is you can actually have the materials change out. Um, every 15, 20 minutes, you could still do your small group if you don't feel comfortable with kids, you know, walking around and moving. Um, other things you can do is you can actually really pump up differentiation and almost have like a must do can do. Um, that's really popular. The must do can do um, choice boards and things like that within your centers don't require kids to move around the classroom as much will we'll help out on, you know, moving and in regards to kids and trying to social distance and stuff. Um, the materials and the things that they do is what changes every, you know, 20 minutes that you actually rotate through your centers, but you still have time to, to do that small group. Um, we talked about what's impossible. If you feel like it's 
it's impossible to cater to those kids' needs and you really don't feel comfortable doing a, a large group of six small group, then you could, I mean, could do one-on-one. -on -one and But just know if you do one-on-one, -on -one, you might only be able to see a kid for five minutes versus if you do a little small group, you could at least have them for 20 minutes. So there's all the you know, there's different things that play a factor when it comes to, you know, how you actually want your kids to rotate either materials or activities through the pandemic. Um, so those are kind of the things that you have to think about. OK, what works best for you? Because we could all be on here um, at, you know, at this time, there's over 10,000, you know, teachers um, just, just follow this community within this community. And I guarantee you every single teacher does centers differently. Every single teacher has their classroom set up differently. So my job with you guys is just to kind of get your gears rolling so that you can think about, okay, what works best for you? What are some of the things that you can take away and implement? And how could you build the best classroom community so that you are able to meet your kids, um, and cater to their needs so that you can um, really push them up. I'm all about closing the educational gap. And unfortunately, it seems like the gap is getting even larger every time it seems like we are closing it, it gets, gets even bigger. So um, one way to you know do that is through centers, is through fun activities. Activities. I know I'm always talking about how to have fun, but it is really true. Um, the impact that positive fun learning has on kids, especially the kids that are behind, the kids that feel like they're inadequate. We talked about the growth mindset. There are a lot of kids that feel like um, they don't have what it takes mentally. I've heard kids say a lot of things that just kind of break my heart. Um, a lot of negative comments about themselves, like they don't feel smart enough, they can't do it. Um, they'll state other words that I don't really want to say because I don't believe it, but I cannot stand when kids say negative things about them because it just shows how they look at themselves and how they look at others. They plan to put others ahead of them. Um, and a big part of that really does come from the learning gap because a lot of the kids that you hear those type of comments from are the kids who are in the red. And when I say red, I mean behind the level. Those are the exact same kids that no matter what assessment we give, they are always behind grade level. Those are those kids that are always behind grade level. And those are the kids that always have, you know, negative things to say about themselves because they haven't seen those um, praise points. Lots of teachers really. All right. Um, Fearless Metal says, it's amazing because lots of teachers really struggle with having time to address individual struggling students' needs. Yes. Um, and that is really what my next few videos are on, is how do you address the individual learning needs with those struggling students? Because it really boils down to centers. And how you set up your differentiated learning centers at the beginning of the school year is what's going to carry you through the whole rest of the school year. Um, so what is something that you guys do? Let me know in the chat box. What is something that you guys do and or have done in the past to kind of meet your kids' needs? And what do you guys think you may have to tweak now that we are teaching after a pandemic? So what are the things that you've done in the past that have worked? Um, and what are some of the things that you can tweak? Um, for me, my thing that has worked is really using centers. I'm going to wait while you guys type. Um, one thing for me that has worked is centers, centers, centers. Um, I'm so structured with centers, having that non-negotiable time um, to automatically go into centers. My, my centers used to run on autopilot like literally autopilot. Um, I have like to share my moment. There was one day and I struggled for migraines. And I don't know if you guys have ever had a migraine or know somebody that have a migraine, but when you get a migraine, you start having like flashing lights and you just have to turn off the lights and take a nap no matter what you're doing. Um, and I did that in right before centers. <laughs> so I had my little timer, that timer went off. I started seeing the flashing lights and it was a wrap.
I told my kids, all right, now I, I probably wasn't supposed to do this, y'all. Probably wasn't supposed to do this. But I turned off the lights. I told my kids, look, I have a migraine. You guys are supposed to go to centers. I need you guys to show me that you guys can do this. I went in the reading center. I took a nap. I told my kids to do the rotation. Um, one of my kids took it upon herself to set the timer. Um, when they went to the guided reading center, they knew exactly what to do. They just pretended like I was there. I had their reading strategies and reading comprehension strategies already on the table. And I took a nap. And um, I remember hearing them whisper like, she's sleeping. Don't make her headache worse. And I said that to say like, the power of doing something consistently and seeing it work. Um, I went, I woke up from my little nap. I looked at my kids and they were all engaged. Every single one of them. They were all in their different centers. They were doing the exact activities I had planned for them. And it was such a positive and rewarding experience for me um like it just it was it was remarkable um and I said that to say like when your kids show you that type of accountability that type of responsibility to do something even without you watching that's kind of the winning moment um that some you know that they have the routines in place um and when it comes to centers like that was I, I was able to really have, have me have that growth mindset talk with my kids all the time. And we actually have a, um, a goal setting board and kids got to change up how they were getting to their goal. So everybody knew they're in their, well, mid year, we did it. We did it each um, semester. So not every quarter, but every semester we set one goal for the end of the semester. And then every single person made their progress towards that goal. Um, and that helped address the individual struggling needs because they were able to kind of see, okay, I'm on this path and I'm going in the right direction. Um, so that's something that helped with the centers. Another thing that helped with centers is I do a lot of work with vocabulary and I do a lot of work with fluency. And if you focus on both math and reading fluency, that helps individual needs and um, vocabulary and phonics also help out individual needs. Because really, uh, I know we, there's a lot of pressure and focus when it comes to reading, but in all actuality, reading over pours into all content areas. And that is why reading does have the same hype that it has is because if you can't read, you can't read the math problems. If you can't read, you can't do you know, word problems. If you can't read, you definitely can't read a chart in science. You can't read the history book. So when it comes to reading, really kind of push fluency and push um, phonics and get kids to kind of track their progress. And that will help them, one, work towards their goal, give them the confidence that we talked about earlier, and address individual learning needs. Center, I agree. Centers and Montessori schools have at this time type of students because it allows for students to learn at reading where they are. Very true. And I know that, um, especially with Montessori schools, they're very hands on, all about hands on, kinesthetic learners. Let's do it in action. Um, how do you guys feel about learning through play? I feel like that is, you know, that's also hands on, but without the explicit instruction. So, um, I know there's a huge wave with like science of reading, balance literacy, um, and then you also have people that believe in whole brain teaching, um, learning through play, and I just feel like they're on. They all have their own place in education, and I can see the different pros and cons in each philosophy. So it's very interesting to see um, all of you guys and kind of where where you guys are. I did have a good group of kids that year. <laughs> yes, I did have a very good group of kids that year. Even the year before that, um, that year were pretty good. So I had like two years of like 
phenomenal kids. Um, the year before that was really challenging. Um, but I even had some behaviors in there, but definitely um, one of the other thing that I did really focus on, it's just what I try to help you guys with is building that classroom community. Cause that's when I realized that classroom community is key. It really is. Building that classroom community is kind of what makes everything function. Um, and those are I've always taught at Title I schools, always. I've never seen outside of what it looks like at a Title I school. Like I've always been at a Title I school. So that shows you what type of kids that I'm used to. But it's all about how you set up your classroom. And that primarily comes from the first two weeks. I've also been in situations where I've come in in the middle of the school year and it was rough coming in in the middle of a school year. Oh, so rough. The kids don't want to listen to you. You're not their teacher. I feel like you're coming in after the kids have had um, a field day because they have any, they either they haven't had a teacher or their teacher left. In my situation, the teacher got a promotion um, and they went like a few months with the sub and then I came in. So it was like, woo, they just did not want to listen. Um, but even then, um, the teaching a lot of EIP kids in Title I, using centers, focusing on vocabulary, other things that I would do. Um, I used to do a lot of lunch breaks. So like eat and learn for kids. It was a privilege. Kids got to come back. I would use that time to work with them one-on-one. I always did um, response to intervention, RTI, in the morning. Always, always. Um, and I'm one that does not believe in any downtime. When we are going to the restroom, I'm asking a lot of fluency questions because there's a lot of things that are repetition. There's a lot of things that you can literally go over. If you're teaching, um, I don't know what you teach, Phyllis Meadows, but I know uh, Vicki Chadwick teaches younger students. Um, she's kindergarten. And so with kindergartners, they're learning sight words, right? So easy, bring your sight word uh, flashcards to the bathroom. While your kids are using the restroom and you're already spending that time in the restroom break, that gives you, what, five minutes? Take those flashcards, review those flashcards, um, give quick little points, you know, a dojo point or so to each child that wins a flashcard. Um, I used to always do dojo on my phone while I was in the hallway. Um, and so the kids, as soon as they're in the bathroom, they're like, oh, yeah, we get extra dojo points. It's time. It's time. And um, that was their time to kind of gain extra dojo points. But we have to whisper. And I made that one of our, you know, routines. Um, but it allows that extra time to practice. Like, now, don't get loud in the hallway. But definitely use any time um, that you have with them to kind of go over stuff. Can you talk about how to build your classroom community? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so um, two things. One, your first two weeks of school is the time to build your classroom community. So coming up, I don't know when you start school. Either you're about to start school right now or you probably don't start school until September. Um, but during those first two weeks, it is crucial that you build Com, um, community and relationships. So you want to set the environment that you want. I suggest that you start off more stern and then lo loosen up later. Um, and I've just learned that from personal experience because like I stated, I, I've always taught at Title I schools. Um, so I always started off really stern, build um, stern and fun stern and fun, and then kind of loosened up as the weeks went through. Um, but I made it very clear what my expectations were every day. I mean, every single day. Um, but build relationships. So I know you probably have seen all my other icebreaker videos where I'm like, classroom icebreakers, woo! But that is one big thing that I suggest you do to build classroom community. And that just because one, it shows that you are relatable to the kids. It shows that you're trying to get to know them and allows them to open up. Now you're not gonna spend all day long, your first two weeks of school doing icebreakers. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is most icebreakers are only 10 minutes, five to 10 minutes max. Spend your entire, at least your first seven days, or I mean five days, your first week. And I have an entire um, back to school icebreaker bundle. Um, I think I have that link down below in the description. And I also have opportunity for you to get a free back to school game if you do a teacher survey for me. That link's also in the description. But 
do five to 10 minutes every single day, the first week of icebreaker. Um, and that one actually sets you up for success. So one is sets you up for class participation. Um, and kids don't realize something as simple as an icebreaker prepares them to participate later on in the school year. Um, it also helps you um, build the environment for collaborative work coming up. Right. Um, and so duels in those icebreakers and not all day, like I said, 10 minutes a day, bam, knock out one a day, just allows them to also build that relationship with you. Um, it's crucial that your kids trust you. If your kids trust you, they will do anything that you ask them to do. Anything, anything at all. Um, but another thing that I did to build a classroom community. Now, this wasn't at the beginning of the year. This is when I had a situation. So I do have, did I have a situation teaching fifth grade? Um, teaching fifth grade had a situation where bullying occurred with my kids. I don't know if y'all can relate. Have you guys ever had an issue, a bullying issue? Um, that's legitimate bullying. Um, but I did have that issue. Um, and I talked to my kids like I talked to a whole group of adults, just giving them that respect. Um, and we talked about bullying. I had them watch videos about bullying, found some videos online, and then I made them do a bullying compact. Um, and they just all wrote like on note cards um, and they wrote um, what bullying meant to them. And they also wrote their promise to our community. And one thing I always state to my kids, and I suggest you guys state it, um, especially if you work at, you know, schools where there may be behaviors outside of your classroom, but always tell your kids, like, this is a family. This is our house. This is our family. I don't care what happens outside, you know, outside of this house, but in this house, we respect each other and we are family. All, all of you guys are brothers and sisters. And I'm like your mom when we're here at school. And I said that over and over and over again. Um, and so then when Willie and occurred, like we did the little compacts and then I actually posted up their compacts and I posted them above the door so that they would see them every single time they walked out, in and out the classroom. Um, so that's one thing that I did to just kind of nip, um, nip bullying in the bud and build that classroom community. Um, another testimony that I can tell you is I received a child from another state. And he came into the classroom really rude. Um, he was using cuss words at me, at me, um, told me this once again, teaching fifth grade, what he wasn't going to do, um, what he, I mean, I couldn't tell him what to do. He was cursing and I'm letting him know very, you know, cause getting new kids is rough, <laughs> but um, um, th we don't do that in this classroom. Like we don't period. Like I had, you have to have like a zero tolerance in order for kids to, you know, conform to whatever type of community. And one good thing is when you have that classroom community and you have your core kids, the kids that start off with you those first two weeks of school, um, they know you, they know the rules, they know the, um, the expectations and they feel safe with you. Um, so this kid was very rough and first week of school, he did something to make me trip. So, you know, good old fifth graders, they, they, they have their own sense of humor. Um, he had like put his foot out, made me trip. Okay. And it, it worked. I tripped. Okay. <laughs> um, I tripped on the floor and he bust out laughing. I mean, funniest thing in the world to him. And all my other kids all were, came, they ran, they tried, picked me up. I mean, I wasn't on the floor long, but they came, picked me up. Um, they were like, stop, that's our teacher and they had my back. I didn't have to say anything. I didn't even scold him. They scolded him for me. Um, and that was one of my testimonies that I can share with you that um, let me know what type of community that I built within my classroom that an outsider was not able to break that. And he only had one choice. You either conformed or you're about to have a miserable year. So needless to say, over time, he stopped cussing. He never did that again because he did not get that um, attention that he was hoping for. And he soon realized like, oh, okay, um, this, this, this is different. This is different than what I'm used to. And I've had a few kids, like rough kids like that. But um, so those are my suggestions of how I was able to build that classroom community is really start off building trust with the kids that start off 
build build exactly how you want your classroom those first two weeks of school. And then whoever, if, you, if you're at a very transient school that gets a lot of new kids, they will conform. Um, but those classroom communities, those classroom relationships, another thing you can do if you have a kid and you think that they are rough or maybe that you might feel like they you know, don't care about learning. Um, I've heard terms like troublemaker, whatever you think, you know, might say of them. One thing I did to really win those type of kids was my lunch and learns because lunch and learns a privilege, you know. Um, and one of the kids I had when I taught fifth grade, um, I had I had a very, very low group. Um, in fact, half of my kids are reading on a kindergarten or first grade level. And when they were in fifth grade and by the end of the year, every single one of them, 100% passed the state standardized test. I was, I was actually shocked. Like I was shocked. I worked my tail off um, because a lot of these kids, those kids, they literally grew like four or five grade levels in one year. Like that is the type of closing the gap growth that I want for every single child in the entire world. Um, but one thing I did to really build that community and work with um, those type of students was my lunch and learn. So what I used to do was the first few lunch and learns was strictly to build relationships. Like, that's it. Um, try to Every child has something. Every child has that something that they enjoy. Find that something. Um, for me, one of my kids um, who previous previously from having me he gave every single teacher he had a rough time and I had to find his something so during my lunch and learns I would just always talk you know just talk to him you might get the whole cold shoulder because most kids don't want to sit and talk to you if they don't trust you yet um but just ask questions um so how's you know how's your home do you have any siblings and the more you share to them the more they will share to you so he would finally tell me he had a sister. And I was like, oh, I wish I had a sister that lived with me. My sister's older, blah, blah, blah. And I would just tell him all these things about me. Well, eventually that got, um, led me to gain his trust. He then told me he wanted to be a comedian. And that was that something. So I used that. And I said, okay, you like to be a comedian. I'll make a deal with you. If we use our lunch and learns and you allow me to teach you, I said, I promise I will teach you how to read. Cause like he actually was two years behind. So he was supposed to be in seventh grade, but he was in fifth grade cause he had failed twice and couldn't read like level a, if you're due Fontes and Pinnell, um, level a that low and would not get tested for, um, disabilities because his mother would not sign the paperwork. So I had him and I was like, I want to teach this baby how to read. Cause I, He's, I feel like he's acting out because he does not know how to read. So and why why sit here and try to figure out what you're t- talking about? I'll just crack a joke. Like he used to make signs. I mean, the whole, whole shebang, the whole shebang. Um, but as soon as I found his something was comedy, I told him, I said, okay, look, allow me to teach you how to read. We will use our lunch and lunch. Nobody has to know. Okay, um, come in here every day. I promise I will do everything I can to get you to read if you pay attention in class. And at the end of the day, like during book back time, if you had a good day, I will let you um, use your comedy hour. And it worked. I won his I won his trust over. And this is what really changed the dynamics of that school year, um, because he was like my class clown that everybody followed. <laughs> There's always that one one kid that everybody loves and they follow. And once I won him over with that one lunch and learn, I mean, there was a process to gain his trust. It truly did change the classroom dynamic because now you had him that respect me. You had him that um, was listening to me. And so we used uh, every, every lunch session, I would teach him. And then when they packed their book bags, I would allow him to crack jokes um, and use his comedy hour. Cause that's what he wanted to be when he grew up. He wanted to be a comedian. So, um, of course, everything had to be appropriate for school. And it only allowed three minutes that the kids were already packing up. So it actually helped a lot of my kids because in order to go to his comedy session, you had to have everything packed up in your book bag. And this is literally while the kids are 
leaving. Um, but that helped me gain his trust and really kind of change the dynamics of my classroom. So that is some of some of my praise reports of how I've combated with um, difficult kids to really build that classroom community. But it really does take the kids to trust you in order for it to work. So some just kind of wrap up um, some tips from even just that testimony is find out that something with your difficult kids. Like every child has something that they like, whether it be what they want to do when they grow up. They might like, I know a big wave now is uh, Minecraft. All these kids love Minecraft, <laughs> but find out what works and use that to your advantage and then build your trust with your kids. Because if you build the trust with them, then they will follow you to the moon. But that takes time. And that is why I say use those first 14 days to build relationships with them so that they start to open up and they can trust you. And then it makes teaching them so much easier. Teaching them discipline, everything will be so much easier once you have that trust within your kids. Um, looking in the chat box, I agree. Zero tolerance, set the classroom expectation. Yes, healthy trust and relationship. Do not engage with verbal dis. Yes, um, do not engage with the verbal disrespect. And there's ways to, um, there are ways to address that. I don't know if you had difficult kids. Um, I know with one of my kids, oh, they cracked a joke. Um, like a few years ago, there was a viral video, especially all these kids have technologies at their fingertips, but there was a viral video that went that went out. You guys might remember it. Um, it was when, I don't think TikTok, none of that even existed yet. So I really don't know how it went viral. But anyways, um, it was a lady and she was getting arrested and the police were trying to arrest her. And then she was like, oh, no, I'm legally blind. PLP holding it down. Let me know in the chat box if y'all remember that video. So my kids were lining up and I was trying to be the teacher, you know, line up, get them going. We actually it was all the whole grade level. We were I think we might have been going on a field field trip or to recess. I don't remember, but I just remember we were going outside. Um, and I had three classrooms and just me. So I was getting three classrooms to line up. So you guys know you have to be very firm then. You're like, okay, I need this class right here, this class right here. So I told all my, all my rules and I had my difficult student and um, he just decided he just wasn't going to line up. Just, I don't need to line up. Um, and just like made his own mind. Just just ignored all the rules that I had going on at the time. And I said, um, are you, are, I actually use the words, are you blind? Do you not see the, mine might not say, are you blind? He's the one that said, are you blind? I forgot what I said, but I said something to the fact that do, don't you see the line? I think that's what I said. Don't you see the line? And he yelled the quote from the viral video. Oh no, I'm legally blind. P.O.P. holding it down. And that was his reaction to me. All the kids laughed, including my student teacher, because I had a student teacher at the time. Everybody's laughing. And I knew exactly where he got that line because I had seen the video. Um, and so all the kids were laughing and it was like they're watching for my reaction. Um, so when it comes to verbal disrespect, remember, they're watching for your reaction. Um, and so you always have to respond in a very professional manner. So for me, I always do like a cool down to really watch every word that comes out of my mouth. And that did take um, experience. This was in life. Um, even on this call, I don't know if you realize it, but even doing this live, like earlier when I was talking about things that kids have said, I paused because there's stuff that I Although I've heard kids, you know, difficult things say that they've said, I always want everything that I say to be positive. So he made those comments and then I had to take my little three seconds to think about how I was going to respond. And then I always put it back on them, make kids reflect on their actions because he wanted a reaction. You have to think about it. Every child does something for a reaction. Everything is done for a reaction. So don't give them the reaction that they're wanting when you have that kid that wants you to lash out or engage in a disrespectful manner. So 
I stated to him, I said, now was that appropriate? I want you to, I want you to think and tell me what that was appropriate. And he said, no, as he's laughing, he was like, no, you're right. You're right. I said, okay. So I want you to tell me what your punishment should be. What, what do you think I should do? Like you tell me the reaction that you want me to have. And he actually stated, man, so I went, I said, if you were the teacher, what would you do? He was like, I wouldn't make me do recess. I said, okay, great. Glad we saw that. And all, all the kids were quiet. They're like, oh. And so then I was like, so does anybody else want um want a reaction? I mean, is, is anybody else want a consequence for, you know, laughing? And all the kids were like, no. So I got all the other kids now on my side because they're all watching to see how I react to him. And then we, we go outside. I said, okay. So we go outside and he goes, so does that mean I have to sit out? And I said, yes, you gave your own consequence. I didn't even give a consequence. So that is one way that you could still maintain that trust. Have that child come up with their own consequence. Have that child do the reflection. Um, and then at the end of recess, I actually asked them, I said, okay, this is something you came up with. So is there anything else that you feel like should happen in order to resolve the problem? And then he said, say sorry. I said, I think that would be a great, that'd be a great step. You know, apologize and we just move forward. But I said all that to say, like, there are, there are going to be kids there. Um, a lot of you guys were online last year. I know a big thing was kids kicking out their teacher. Um, let me know in the comments that that happened to you guys. There were kids just doing crazy things. Like kids are going to be kids and we have to expect them to be kids the same way they're expecting us to be the teachers. And believe it or not, believe it or not, kids want routines. They want discipline. They, they, they need it. Kids without discipline and routine and structure really fall apart the same way with us. Can you imagine if we had a, we went to a school and you know, you're teaching and your principal just says, huh, whatever. And they give you no guidance. You don't know what they want you to teach. You don't you don't even know a grade level. They just gave you a room. Okay. There's no class list. There's nothing. Like no routine. You just have a whole bunch of teachers and no routine. You would go crazy, right? You would say, okay, where's the structure? What am I supposed to do? What do you expect out of me? Kids were at the same way. They want to know what they expect. They want to know... Um, what they can do to make you happy. Kids are actually, a lot of them are people pleasers. They want to please you. So give them that, give them that, give them your expectations, give them, um, give them the routine. And in order for them to follow that routine day in and day out, they must trust you. And trust comes from having a rapport and building a relationship with that child. So it's really a domino effect, right? Um, and that's what's going to set us, you know, set us ahead of trying to close this gap because these kids are coming to us behind. And in order to teach them, we have to do all these other things first. In order to teach them and in order to advance them, we have to build that trust. We have to have the trust come from that relationship. We have to have that relationship come from structure, that structure come from the classroom routines and that classroom community that you're setting up the first two weeks of school. That was a great uh, recap of this entire call. Thank y'all. <laughs> um, but that overall is exactly how we get to closing that gap over here is by starting over here and truly, truly, truly building up that classroom environment, that classroom community, our family. Think about what would you want your family to look like, okay? Because these kids are your family. What do you want that them to look like? What are the type of interactions that you want them to have? If you're a mom, how do you want your kids to interact? Well, your kids are your students. So you have to show them how they should react with one another, how they need to support each other, how they need to talk to each other and do those type of things. Um, during these first two weeks, in order to build those, you know, build that trust, please, 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 please fill out that survey so I know what you guys need help with so that I'm able to help you guys. Um, I'm going to be literally using that survey to create content um, and to give, be able to show up and be here for you guys. So 
please um, fill out that comment. I mean, fill out the survey that I have down below in the description so that we can move forward and um, grow as a community. Um, let me know if you guys have any last questions. I do, do, do encourage you to do the survey because I will be reaching out and giving you one of the back to school games out of that bundle. There is a complete bundle that takes you through your entire first week of school. There are six games. Plus I'm giving y'all a seventh game. I do have the school, school charades, like going back to school charade. That is free, um, completely free. So all of those links are down below in the description. So please, please, please get your, get your, get your free games. Like that's two free games. You get your school charade game and you can get a free game out of the back to school bundle for doing a survey. Winning. I'm helping y'all out. Um, and then that lets me know what you need help with. So use your voice, get it all off your chest, all your worries. Um, like we said earlier, there's certain things that we can't control. We can't control the environment. We can control what we do within the environment. So just kind of keep that in mind. We can't control the deck of cards that we're given. And let's say we're playing spades, right? Um, I love spades, by the way. Where are my card lovers at? Anybody else love to play cards? I love to play cards. But you're playing a game of spades. You can't control the cards that are given to you, but you can control how you play the cards, okay? You can still win a game if you don't have all the face cards. Just has all comes with strategy and how to work the cards that you actually have. All right. So with that, I want to say thank you guys so much for tuning in. I will do this again in two weeks. So every two weeks, Friday, one o'clock, we will be doing a live. So come up with all your questions. Um, you can always feel free to comment, comment, email. Um, I do. Oh, I forgot to tell you guys. I am um, officially, if you guys have any questions, I'm open to helping you. You can work with me now one-on-one. -on -one, and if you're an administrator, you can also do a um, professional development. I do do professional developments, guided reading, uh, writing workshop, centers, engagement with rigors, all of that good stuff. Um, so I actually have the link in the description for you to work with me. So if you're a teacher and you're like, I really need um, some guidance, some help. You can just work with me for one session. Um, so you can book a session, a consulting session with me. Um, there's a form you fill out. You let me know exactly what your needs are. And then we're able to have a call where I can bring you all the different strategies you need. And there is a money back guarantee with that. If you, it's a 24 hour money back, um, risk for you money back guarantee that you're able to get your money back. If you feel like you did not get the strategies you needed in that call, but I'm so, 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 so confident that you're not going to need Need that you're not gonna need that at all. So down below in the description, there is the work with me link, and there's also the back to school survey link. Thank you guys so much. Remember, go out there, make a future, build your classroom community by building relationships, building trust, and also building your routines that you want to carry you out throughout the rest of the school year. All right. All right, looks like we don't have any more questions in the comments. I will see you guys later.